The NSA just called me. We have a problem in East Timor. What kind of problem? A big one. Hello there, Sir from 70 once again. This is my Splinter Cell Pandora Tomorrow hard difficulty video walkthrough. We are on mission 5. This is the refinery in Kudang, Indonesia. This is going to be a double banger episode. And this is one of the jungle missions. So right now we're meeting up with Doug Shetland, who I have a little bit more resonance with at this moment in time as I'm showing you some of the interesting uh, detection on some of the earlier Splinter Cell games. So Doug Shetland is a guy that you've worked with. He's somebody that's become a little bit disenfranchised on Chaos Theory and is uh, the leader of a, a private military corporation. But I'm not going to talk too much about Chaos Theory because this isn't that game. This is Pandora Tomorrow and I've just finished recording um, Chaos Theory so there's a lot of contrast that I have between this game and that game and the first thing I'm noticing immediately is just the difference in the lighting and the visuals. So I think this game looks great. Obviously it could look better but as it stands I think it's a, a fine looking game. I wish the port was better but you know sometimes beggars can't be choosers which is an expression people like to use a lot which uh, I understand the the notion of such expressions I just don't really get it when people like to call themselves beggars. <laughs> like do you beg? Are you poor? Are you poverty stricken? Are you destitute? Is there a reason why you have to beg? Did you in fact beg at any point to be the beggar in the aforementioned part of that phrase? Probably not, who knows. But I think this game looks good, but the lighting on this game is so different. The first thing you'll notice when you watch the Chaos Theory videos that are coming is you'll see it is vastly different on a lighting front. Vastly, vastly different. It's much more realistic. The, the graphical level is so high on Chaos Theory, the jump from this from the first two games to it, that it's night and day visually. And that is not selling this short because I think this is a fantastic looking game. But that new one I say the new one, it's actually quite old, it was new back in the day. But Chaos Theory really, really does have some very exceptionally realistic and beautiful lighting. What I did just there, folks, is I used that explosion to sneak in the grass because the grass although it shows that I am quite you know well lit it does give you decent camouflage but you need to be aware of these trips on the ground so you'll notice I keep going into thermals the reason I'm using my thermal series because if I don't I'm gonna trip one of those and it's either gonna get me killed or it's gonna set off an alarm either of which is a fail state in, in the way I'm playing so I'll be restarting but the path that I've got here is a pretty confident motion through this area and it's one of those very rare circumstances where you can kind of ignore just how bright you are and that's another thing you'll notice look at that the guy walks through the trap I have issue with that on so many levels but I guess it you know it's one of those things I like the game world to have a universal laws and I like the player and the enemies to, to abide by them so when you see moments like that you just kinda of shake your fist come on guys that's not fair but games aren't fair guys you know they're not and that's how they work that's how they've always worked more so in the older days than now but still they just they were never intended to give you a fair experience you know it's not chess but keep on pushing forward through this area and you'll notice on Pandora tomorrow you have three light boxes you have really dark mid dark and then well lit and that gradation of that scale is pretty loose on its you know on how you are punished by it chaos theory completely different don't know if it's because that game has an expert difficulty which uh, is above hard I assume you know maybe these games have an expert difficulty but I don't think they do because I did check really? but on that game you have the biggest light meter of any I've seen it is a very very large scale of no, illumination and if you are not so at the complete left hand side of it the enemies can see it they can't, you know, oh, there's Sam Fisher, shoot him. You know, they don't see you like that. They, they can tell something's there and they'll come and investigate. So right now, because my um, indicator wasn't fully on the left-hand side, these people would, would know something was up. If this was Chaos Theory, I could not do what I'm doing right now. And uh, one of the things I noticed most was just this distinction of... 
I'm not going to say it's harder because I don't think it is. Stricter maybe? Or a little bit more fiddly? Uh, all I know is my favourite Splinter Cell game is Chaos Theory but I think it's been the worst one to record. Because I think these games, I came into them looking at them as if you know, they weren't perfect, they were kind of flawed, but I really liked them from my childhood, and I've come back and played them, and they work surprisingly well, and they've surprised me several times, and they've made me truly, really appreciate them. Whereas Chaos Theory, to me, was the first Splinter Cell that really, really worked, and really did everything great. Uh, that right there, I made a noise to get into this shadow, but it doesn't matter, because it puts me in a really powerful position, and it's much quicker than it would have been. This guy is not going to have any clue where we are. He's just going to do his usual AI thing. Once again, if this was Chaos Theory, boom, I'd probably be being shot right now. But it isn't, and that's the joy. But as I was saying, Chaos Theory suffered the most, because this is a game that I went into remembering it, you know, truly bringing all the elements together and working really well. And then I came up across a lot of problems, and a lot of issues, and a lot of just... Some of it's probably not to do with Chaos Theory, some of it's to do with the ports, because the ports are fucking horrendous, and I don't want people to misconstrue me as, as banging on Splinter Cell, because I love this franchise, I think it's probably the best stealth series that exists, in my opinion, and I have tons of fond memories of it, even if I don't support them getting rid of Michael Ironside as the voice, even if I don't support you know the fact it's gone a lot more action-based now, even though you can still be stealthy. But still, I think these games are stellar. They are top form of, of exactly what they are. That being said, though, these ports are enough to to be absolutely shameful. Like, I think Ubisoft should be fucking ashamed. And I don't know who handled them. It might not have even been in-house. It could have been somebody else. But for them to show such a blatant disrespect for a franchise that essentially built their company... I think it's very sad, and I think it's sad for everybody who appreciates these games, and I think it's sad for everybody who worked on these games, and that's what I'm insulting there, folks. However, this is the internet, and you do get a lot of people white knighting any cause they can, just so they can cause a discourse or insult you, and that's just kind of how it works. But, this is a nice sequence here. There's the fire lighting that area, we've got some good cover by these boxes, and there's these two guys talking in this guard. Uh, at post house thing. We're going to time this so that he's going to walk away, the dude in the vest, and we're going to go and probably take out the guy in the booth. You'll also notice there's a lot of whistling on this one. Uh, the main theme of this game is is that da 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 kind of tune, and the people in the levels whistle it, which I think is a really, really neat touch. There's a little bit of whistling on, on the first game, and there's a little bit of whistling on Chaos Theory, but this is definitely the one that I associate with, you know, the Splinter Cell whistle. Which I think we do have access to now, if you press the L2. Sam will do a whistle. However, I never really find it that useful, because I find it to be too loud. Of course, that's not to be confused with it doesn't have a purpose, because it does. I reckon you can do some really fancy stuff with the whistle. I just prefer to use footsteps or light switches because people on this game have this obsession with, with lights which is really really useful for us and that is something that's going to be expanded upon big time in Chaos Theory but uh, as tempting as it is to talk Chaos Theory I need to talk Pandora tomorrow so as we move through here you'll notice the light is not on our side guy right there saw us this guy has a dog And dogs are, are an interesting mechanic. I think they did them very gracefully. It could have been much worse. They're essentially a slow-moving enemy that knows where you are. It doesn't know where you are in, in as much that it immediately sets an alarm off. It just has it follow you. And if it gets in close proximity, it sets an alarm off. And I think it works. And what I'm doing here is I'm... I'm if you knock the dogs out, the handlers will not look at it as suspicious. They'll just look at it as the dog's gone to sleep because dogs do that sometimes and it enables us to get rid of it and not have any alerts or any uh, people suspicious as to what is happening and it enables me then to move across here into this nice patch of shadows and approach this camp. But I don't know if anybody watching this was around when this game first came out. I got it for the GameCube because I was very much a, a GameCube kind of guy at that time and I had the original on the GameCube as well. And the thing that was kind of the selling point for this game was the jungles. 
You know, it was this notion of, of Sam was going into different terrain this time. And I'll never forget some of the early concept arts, which showed you this kind of green suit he's wearing. If you notice, it's all kinds of different shades of green. And it was just... It was like the sequels to the uh, to the late 80s slash early 80s slash early 90s kind of generation of filmmaking where if you wanted to make a schlocky action film, you were going to make several sequels. And the sequels did not literally have to have any extra purpose. They didn't have to have anything. They could just exist because you wanted more of Chuck Norris or you wanted more of Jean-Claude Van Damme or whatever it was. And they would literally be the first film in a jungle, the second film, you know, in a city type of deal. It was that situation that somehow everybody loved in the first film. Well, now it's in Iceland, or, you know, it's underwater. And that's kind of what they did a lot, and you'll notice they pumped out tons and tons of movies that way. And this was kind of that feeling, that kind of 80s action movie, pumping it out, Arnold Schwarzenegger goes from a city to a jungle kind of thing, and... I can remember being really excited for it. Because the, at this point, there weren't many games that did jungles very well. And I'm not to say that this does jungles, you know, stupendously, because I don't think it does. This is a very linear game. I think the jungle aspects of it are very nice, and it's great eye candy. But when I think jungles, I think, like, Goldeneye, and that one level, which was so foggy, it was really difficult to see people. And that is pretty much it at this point. And then when you when you think of jungles now, there's a whole host of, of better things. Like, look at all what Crisis have done, and Far Cry, and all that engines and those technologies. You know, look at the any of those big kind of series is that, that have come along and done it really well. Look at games like Snake Eater, in the Metal Gear series, which did a really, really nice, you know, forest. I still don't think we've done jungles good enough, because I don't think we've, we've gave the player enough tools to do things interesting in the jungle. Like, how many people watched uh, First Blood Part 2 and saw Sylvester Stallone in that mud wall and that dude walks past him and he opens his eyes and takes him out and your mind was blown and it was the coolest moment ever and you're like, that is so cool. We, we need to have an interactive jungle. And there might be one somewhere that I've not you know, come across in my times playing different games. But just this... Th be careful here, guys. This was a nightmare. For some reason, when I climb up here, even when this guy has his back to you, sometimes he'll spin around. I don't know what it was. I couldn't tell you what it was. But just know that that took about three or four times going up that bloody ladder just because of bullshit and, and weird detection. And it happens. It does happen. It's, it's one of those things. But there is a crossfade. That means it went to a loading screen to, to transition between zones. And this is when we get to probably a more tricky area because you see the guy in the red beret that is Sedano that is the dude who keeps going Pandora tomorrow and we're going to be following him through this this terrorist camp or whatever this is and stuff's going to get pretty interesting but I just think there's there's a lot of ideas and there's a lot of mechanics that we could use in, in an environment like a jungle that we just haven't really had the chance to, to fully experience yet and I think that could be really really cool like you know how games now have a lot of crafting mechanics like look at Last of Us where you open a desk and there's some bits and pieces in it and you pick it up and then you can use that to make a Molotov like you get some some flannels and some alcohol and stuff and boom you can craft things well just imagine that kind of idea but extrapolated and, and made a hell of a lot more complex where you could essentially do what Arnie does at the end of Predator where he's making traps and he's getting all Boy Scouts on shit and he's cutting down trees and he's, you know, sharpening stuff and, and setting up all kinds of conventional, you know, trapping techniques and it can be as creative as you are, you know, it can be as daft as, as you want to make it but I just think there's a lot of, of opportunities for, for cool things and... It'd motivate gameplay in some interesting ways. All of it might not be that interesting, but it gives it something different. Like, imagine if you had to dig a latrine. Like, the longer you went without digging a latrine, the more your character became, like, less responsive or, or his stamina went down or something silly like that. Obviously, I wouldn't really want it to work that way, but just something that gives you an extra depth of doing stuff in a jungle. And it doesn't have to do with shitting in a big hole, but that was just an example. Like, I was watching The Order 1886 the other day, 
If you don't know, there's there's a guy who's already got it and he's put a full walkthrough up on YouTube. And it's not a fucking walkthrough because the guy's dying and restarting and he doesn't know where he's going. Like, everybody watching that video knows as much about that game as he does. The only difference being is he's steering it. That is literally the only difference. But he calls it a walkthrough because everybody does. And... He's got the game early, and there's a lot of rumours. There was a rumour from, I think, like a Greek magazine that said it's only three hours long, that's why all the review copies are late to be sent out, because it's essentially an interactive movie, lots of quick time events, very short game, and everybody's like, oh my god, it's such a terrible thing, a short game in this day and age, the exclusive that's going to make the PS4 the greatest thing since whatever was the greatest thing before, like, and everybody's getting really over excited and hyperbolic and hysterical, and it's just retarded, really, like... Just look at any speedrun, guys. You can beat games really quickly if you know what you're doing, and even if you don't have to know what you're doing to beat it quickly, maybe what is there is really, really good. Maybe the story is really, really good. There's really no reason until you've played it to be going like, oh, it's a piece of shit. Maybe it's a game that you can replay a million times in a day and you never get bored and you're playing it for the next ten years, you know? It's, it all depends on what it means to you. But this guy's got a full playthrough up of it. So I watched him do it. And I watched about the first four levels, and the game looks absolutely beautiful, it looks really, really good. But aside from that, it looks fucking nothing. It is such a null game, it's not even funny. There is nothing in that game that makes that makes it go, this is what we do, this is what we are. There's nothing there. It's just a shooter, it's a third person shooter that looks really nice, and that is literally all it does, it does nothing else. There was this little sequence with a werewolf that looked kind of interesting. There's an interesting perspective. There's the potential for creative guns, but in the first four levels he picked up like two. And it was just... there was nothing. There was no stealthing sections. There was there was no, you know, platforming. There was It was just shooting, quick time, shooting, quick times. And it was literally more simple than Gears of War 1. And I'm sat there watching this game and just waiting for something that says, you know, we are the order, this is what we do well. Because the shooting looked like any other shooter you could have ever played. And I'm hoping that the story is super amazing and that's the reason why the pacing on the game seemed so slow. But I just don't think it will be. And Like, I saw no hook, I saw no gimmick, I saw nothing. So I'm sat there watching the first four levels of this game that I was going to buy a PS4 for. And I'm just thinking, I don't even know if I'm going to play this. I mean, it looks great, but... I read somewhere that the difficulty on that game is dynamic, and dynamic difficulty means if you're playing shit the game gets easier, so there's no way you're going to struggle through it because the game will get easier, so it makes my job as a walkthrough maker completely redundant. What am I going to do? Play amazingly well so the game is super hard and then nobody else has that because if you are struggling with it the game's going to make itself easier anyway, like, it doesn't make any sense at that point. And the game is not interesting to watch folks because I'm somebody who never gets bored by games, but I sat watching this thing and I felt like I was watching a fucking clock turn. So, I don't know what that game's meant to be, but I hope it's much better than what I saw. I really do, just for the people that are super stoked for it. But thank you for watching, guys. A little bit more strategy to talk in the next video, but probably it'll just be tangents and me randomly talking, which a lot of people like, a lot of people dislike. You know, you pick your poisons on this channel, or you go to another one.